Hello, hello, welcome back to another section of the Lincoln Highway by Amor Tolls. We are in the second half. It's going well. Hope that you're enjoying this one if you've been following along. And um, if you're here for the first time, just checking out the channel. Hi, I'm Julie. I read books over here. So if that's something that's interesting to you, consider uh, subscribing so that you can uh, follow along with this book or books in the future. Um, if you are looking to check out this book from the beginning, I believe I made a playlist so you can just hop in there and um, start with, you know, whatever, uh, whatever section you are on. But today we're starting on page 317 or in the middle of an Emmett chapter. I'm just going to adjust this a little bit. Ooh, a little lopsided now. There we go. All right. Um, page 317, Emmett chapter. We've got a little page break, so bottom half of the page. Let's go. The address that Mr. Cohen gave Emmett for Harrison Hewitt led him to a dingy hotel on a dingy street in downtown Manhattan. From the well-mannered man who answered the door of room 42, Emmett learned to his disappointment that Mr. Hewitt was no longer a resident. But he also learned that Mr. Hewitt's son had been there the previous morning and had apparently checked into the hotel for the night. Perhaps he's still here, said the gentleman. In the lobby, the clerk with the pencil-thin mustache said, Sure, sure, he knew who Emmett was talking about, Harry Hewitt's kid. He showed up asking about his old man's whereabouts, then booked two rooms for the night. But he wasn't there no more. He and his daydreaming pal had left around noon. With my fucking radio, added the clerk. Did he happen to say where he was going? He might have. Might have? asked Emmett. The clerk leaned back in his chair. When I helped your friend find his father, he gave me ten bucks. According to the clerk, Emmett would be able to find Duchess's father by speaking to a friend of his who drank at a West Side saloon every night after eight. With time to spare, Emmett walked up Broadway until he found a coffee shop that was busy, clean, and well-lit. Sitting at the counter, he, order, he ordered the special and a piece of pie. He finished his meal with three cups of coffee and a cigarette that he bummed from his waitress, an Irish woman named Maureen, who, despite being ten times busier than Mrs. Burke, had ten times her grace. The information from the hotel clerk sent Emmett back to Times Square, which, in the hour before dusk, was already incandescent with brightly lit signs announcing cigarettes, cars, appliances, hotels, and theaters. The sheer scale and garishness of it all made Emmett disinclined to buy a single thing that was being advertised. Emmett returned to the newsstand on the corner of 42nd Street, where he found the same newsman from earlier in the day. This time, the newsman pointed to the northern end of the square, where a giant sign for a Canadian club whiskey was shining ten stories above the street. See that sign? Just beyond it. Take a left until 45th and keep walking till you've run out of Manhattan. Over the course of the day, Emmett had grown accustomed to being ignored. He'd been ignored by the commuters on the subway, subway train, by the pedestrians on the sidewalks, and the performers in the waiting rooms, chalking it up to the in inimicality of city life. So he was a little surprised to discover that once he was beyond 8th Avenue, he wasn't ignored anymore. On the corner of 9th Avenue, he was eyed by a beat cop in the middle of his rounds. On 10th Avenue, he was approached by one young man offering to sell him drugs and another offering to sell him his company. As he approached 11th, he was beckoned by an old black beggar whom he avoided by quickening his pace only to run into an old white, white beggar a few steps later. Having found the anonymity of the morning somewhat off-putting, Emmett would have welcomed it now. He felt, the under, he felt he understood why the people of New York walked with that purposeful urgency. It was a dissuasive signal to the vagrants and drifters and the rest of the fallen. Just before the river, he found the anchor, the bar the clerk had told him about. Given its name and location, Emmett had imagined it would be a spot that catered to sailors or members of the Merchant Marine. If it ever had, the association had lapsed long ago. 
for inside there wasn't a man you might call seaworthy. To Emmett's eye, they all looked one step above the old beggars he'd dodged in the street. Having learned from Mr. Morton how reluctant the agents were to share whereabouts, Emmett was worried that the bartender might be equally tight-lipped, or perhaps, like the clerk at the Sunshine Hotel, he would expect to be handsomely reimbursed. But when Emmett explained that he was looking for a man named Fitzwilliams, the bartender said that he'd come to the right place. So Emmett had taken a seat at the bar and ordered the beer. When the door of the anchor opened shortly after eight and a man in his sixties entered, the bartender gave Emmett the nod. From his stool, Emmett watched as the old man made his way slowly to the bar, picked up a glass and a half-empty bottle of whiskey, and retreated to a table in the corner. As Fitzwilliams poured himself a drink, Emmett recalled the stories that Duchess had told of his rise and fall. It wasn't easy to imagine that this thin, shuffling, forlorn-looking man had once been paid handsomely to pay the, play the part of Santa Claus. Leaving some money on the bar, Emmett approached the old performer's table. Excuse me, are you Mr. Fitzwilliams? When Emmett heard the word Mr. said the word Mr., Fitzwilliams looked up with a touch of surprise. Yes, he admitted after a moment. I am Mr. Fitzwilliams. Taking the empty chair, Emmett explained that he was a friend of Duchess's. I gather he may have come here last night to speak with Oh, I gather he may have come here last night to speak with you. The old performer nodded, as if now he understood, as if he should have known. Yes, he said in a tone that verged on an admission. He was here. He was trying to find his father because of a little unfinished business between them. But Harry had left town, and Duchess didn't know where he'd gone, so he came to see Fitzy. Fitzwilliams offered Emmett a half-hearted smile, I'm an old friend of the family's, you see. Returning the smile, Emmett asked Fitzwilliams if he had told Duchess where Mr. Hewitt had gone. I did, the old performer said, nodding his head at first, then shaking it. I told him where Harry went, to the Olympic Hotel in Syracuse. And that's where Duchess will go, I suppose, after he sees his friend. Which friend is that? Oh, Duchess didn't say, but it was... It was in Harlem. Harlem? Yes. Isn't that funny? No, it makes perfect sense. Thank you, Mr. Fitzwilliams. You've been very helpful. When Emmett pushed back his chair, Fitzwilliams looked up in surprise. You're not going, are you? Surely, as two old friends of the Hewitts, we should have a drink in their honor? Having learned what he had come to learn, and certain that Billy would be wondering where he was by now, and it had no desire to remain at the anchor. But having initially looked like he didn't want to be disturbed, the old performer suddenly looked like he didn't want to be alone. So Emmett got another glass from the bartender and returned to the table. After Fitzwilliams had poured their whiskies, he raised his glass. To Harry and Duchess. To Harry and Duchess, echoed Emmett. When they both had taken a drink and set down their glasses, Fitzwilliams smiled a little sadly, as if moved by a bittersweet memory. Do you know why they call him that? Duchess, I mean. I think he told me it was because he was born in Duchess County. No, said Fitzwilliams with a shake of the head and his half-hearted smile. That wasn't it. He was born here in Manhattan. I remember the night. Before continuing, Fitzwilliams took another drink, almost as if he needed to. His mother, Delphine, what a beautiful young Parisian, and a singer of love songs in the manner of Piaf. In the years before Duchess was born, she performed at all the great supper clubs, at El Morocco and the Stork Club and the Rainbow Room. I'm sure she would have become quite famous, at least in New York, if it weren't for becoming so sick. It was tuberculosis, I think, but I can't, really can't remember. Isn't that terrible? A beautiful woman like that, a friend, dies in the prime of her life, and I can't even remember from what. Shaking his head in self-condemnation, Fitzwilliams raised his glass, but set it back down without taking a drink, 
as if he sensed that to have done so would have been an insult to her memory. The story of Mrs. Hewitt's death caught Emmett a little off guard, for in the few times that Duchess had mentioned his mother, he had always spoken as if she had abandoned them. At any rate, Fitzwilliams continued, Delphine doted on her little boy. When there was money, she would quietly hide some from Harry so that she could buy him new clothes, cute little outfits like those, what do you call them, uh, lederhosen. She would dress him up in his finery, letting his hair grow down to his shoulders. But when she became bedridden, and she would send him downstairs into the taverns to bring Harry home, Harry would... Fitzwilliams shook his head. Well, you know, Harry, after a few drinks, it's hard to tell where Shakespeare ends and Harry begins. So when the boy would come through the door, Harry would stand up from his stool, make an elaborate flourish, and say, Ladies and gentlemen, I present to you the Duchess of Alba. And the next time it would be the Duchess of Kent or the Duchess of Tripoli. Pretty soon, some of the others began calling the boy Duchess. Then we all called him Duchess, every last one of us, to the point where no one could even remember his given name. Fitzwilliams raised his glass again, this time taking a good long drink. When he set the glass down, Emmett was startled to see that the old performer had begun to cry, letting the tears roll down his cheeks without bothering to wipe them away. Fitzwilliams gestured to the bottle. He gave me that, you know. Duchess, I mean, despite everything. Despite all of it. Last night he came here and bought me a brand new bottle of my favorite whiskey, just like that. Fitzwilliams took a deep breath. He was sent away to a work camp in Kansas, you know, at the age of 16. Yes, said Emmett. That's where we met. Ah. I see. But in all your time together, did he ever tell you? Did he ever tell you how he came to be there? No, said Emmett. He never did. Then, after taking the liberty of pouring a little more of the old man's whiskey into both of their glasses, Emmett waited. That's the end of Duchess's chapter on page two, uh, 324 with a chapter from Ulysses. Though the boy had already read the story once from beginning to end, Ulysses asked him to read it again. Shortly after 10, with the sun having set, the moon yet to rise, and the others retreating to their tents, Billy had taken out his book and asked if Ulysses would like to hear the story of Ishmael, a young sailor who joined a one-legged captain on his hunt for a great white whale. Though Ulysses had never heard the story of Ishmael, he had no doubt it would be a good one. Each of the boys' stories had been good, but when Billy had offered to read this new adventure with a touch of embarrassment, Ulysses had asked if he would read the story of his namesake instead. The boy hadn't hesitated. By the waning light of Stu's fire, he had turned to the back of his book and illuminated the page with his flashlight beam, a circle of light within a circle of light within a sea of darkness. As Billy began, Ulysses felt a moment of worry that having read the story once before, the boy might paraphrase or skip over passages. But Billy seemed to understand that if the story was worth reading again, it was worth reading word for word. Yes, the boy read the story exactly as he had in the boxcar, but Ulysses didn't hear it the same way. For this time, he knew what was to come. He knew now to look forward to some parts and dread others. To look forward to how Ulysses bested the Cyclops by hiding his men under the pelts of sheep, and to dread the moment when the covetous crew unleashed the winds of Alias, setting their captain's ship off course at the very moment that his homeland had come into view. When the story was over, and Billy had closed his book and switched off his light, and Ulysses had taken up Stu's shovel to cover the embers, Billy asked if he would tell a story. Ulysses looked down with a smile. I don't have any story books, Billy. You don't have to tell a story from a book, Billy replied. You can tell a story from yourself, like one from the war overseas. 
Do you have any of those? Ulysses turned the shovel in his hand. Did he have any stories from the war? Of course he did. More than he cared to remember, for his stories had not been softened by the mists of time or brightened by the tropes of a poet. They remained vivid and severe. So vivid and severe that whenever one happened to surface in his mind, Ulysses would bury it just as he had been about to bury the embers of this fire. If Ulysses couldn't stomach the sharing of the memories with himself, he certainly wasn't going to share them with an eight-year-old boy. But Billy's request was a fair one. Generously, he had opened the pages of his book and told the stories of Sinbad and Jason and Achilles and of Ulysses' namesake twice. He had certainly earned a telling in return. So, setting the shovel aside, Ulysses threw another log on the fire and resumed his seat on the railroad tie. I have a story for you, he said. A story about my own encounter with the King of the Winds. When you were sailing across the wine dark sea? No, said Ulysses. When I was walking across the dry and dusty land. The story began on a rural road in Iowa in the summer of 1952. Few days before, Ulysses had boarded a train to Utah intending to travel over the Rockies and across the plains to Chicago. But halfway through Iowa, the boxcar in which he was traveling was shunted onto a siding in order to wait for a different locomotive, which was scheduled to arrive who, know, who knew when. Forty miles away was the junction in Des Moines where he could easily catch another train headed east or one headed north toward the lakes or south to New Orleans. With that in mind, Ulysses had disembarked and begun working his way across the countryside on foot. He had walked about ten miles down an old dirt road when he began to sense that something was amiss. The first sign was the birds, or rather, the absence of them. When you're traveling back and forth across the country, Ulysses explained, the one great constant is the companionship of birds. On your way from Miami to Seattle or Boston to San Diego, the landscape is always changing. But wherever you go, the birds are there. The pigeons or buzzards, condors or cardinals, blue jays or blackbirds, living on the road, you wake to the sound of their singing at dawn and you lay yourself down to their chatter at dusk. And yet, as Ulysses walked along this rural road, there wasn't a bird to be seen not circling over the fields or perched upon the telephone wires. The second what sign was the caravan of cars. While throughout the morning Ulysses had been passed by the occasional pickup or sedan moving along at 40 miles an hour, suddenly he saw an assortment of 15 cars, including a black limousine, speeding in his direction. The vehicles were driving so fast he had to step off the shoulder in order to shield himself from the gravel that was kicked up by their tires. After watching them race past, Ulysses turned back to look in the direction from which they'd come. That's when he saw that the sky in the east was turning from blue to green, which in that part of the country, as Billy well knew, could only mean one thing. Behind Ulysses was nothing but knee-high corn for as far as the eye could see, but half a mile ahead was a farmhouse. With the sky growing darker by the minute, Ulysses began to run. As he drew closer, Ulysses could see that the farmhouse had already been battered down, battened down, its doors and shutters closed. He could see the owner securing the bar, then dashing to the hatch of his shelter where his wife and children waited. And when the farmer reached his family, Ulysses could see the young boy pointing in his direction. As the four looked his way, Ulysses slowed from a run to a walk with his hands at his side. The farmer instructed his wife and children to go into the shelter, first the wife so that she could help the children, then the daughter, and then the little boy, who continued to look at Ulysses right up until the moment he disappeared from sight. Ulysses expected the father to follow his family down the ladder, but leaning over to say one last thing, he closed the hatch, turned toward Ulysses, and waited for his approach. Maybe there was no lock on the shelter's hatch, thought Ulysses, and the farmer figured if there was going to be a confrontation, then better to have it now while still above ground. Or maybe, he felt, if one man intends to refuse harbor to another, he should do so face to face. 
As a sign of respect, Ulysses came to a stop six paces away, close enough to be heard, but far enough to pose no threat. The two men studied each other as the wind began to lift the dust around their feet. I'm not from around these parts, Ulysses said after a moment. I'm just a Christian working my way to Des Moines so I can catch a train. The farmer nodded. He nodded in a manner that he said he believed Christ Ulysses was a Christian and that he was on his way to catch a train, but that under the circumstances, neither of those things mattered. I don't know you, he said simply. No, you don't, agreed Ulysses. For a moment, Ulysses considered helping the man come to know him by telling him his name, telling him that he'd been raised in Tennessee, that he was a veteran, and that he once had a wife and a child of his own. But even as these thoughts passed through Ulysses' mind, he knew that the telling of them wouldn't matter either, and he knew it without resentment. For were the positions reversed, were Ulysses about to climb down into a shelter, a windowless space beneath the ground that he had dug with his own hands for the safety of his family, and were a six-foot-tall white man suddenly to appear, he wouldn't have welcomed him either. He would have sent him on his way. After all, what was a man in the prime of his life doing crossing the country on foot with nothing but a canvas bag slung over his shoulder? A man like that must have made certain choices. He had chosen to abandon his family, his township, his church, in pursuit of something different, in pursuit of a life unhindered, unanswered, and alone. Well, if that's what he had worked so hard to become, then why in a moment like this should he expect to be treated as anything different? I understand, said Ulysses, though the man had not explained himself. The farmer looked at Ulysses for a moment, then turning to his right, he pointed to a thin white spire rising from a grove of trees. The Unitarian Church is a little less than a mile. It's got a basement, and you've got a good chance of making it if you run. Thank you, said Ulysses. As they stood facing each other, Ulysses knew that the farmer had been right. Any chance he had of making it to the church in time was predicted on his going as quickly as he could. But Ulysses had no intention of breaking into a run in front of another man, however good his advice. It was a matter of dignity. After waiting, the farmer seemed to understand this, and with a shake of the head that laid no blame on anyone, including himself, he opened his hatch and joined his family. With a glance at the steeple, Ulysses could tell that the shortest route to the church was directly across the fields rather than by way of the road, so that's the way he went, running as the crow would fly. It didn't take long for him to realize that this was a mistake. Though the corn was only a foot and a half high and the farmer's rows were wide and well kept, the ground itself was soft and uneven, making for cumbersome work. Given all the fields he'd slogged across in Italy, he should have known better, but it seemed too late to switch back to the road now, so with his eye on the steeple, he pressed ahead as best he could. When he was halfway to the church, the twister appeared in the distance at two o'clock, a dark black finger reaching down from the sky, the inversion of the steeple, both in color and intent. With every step now, Ulysses' progress was slowing. There was so much debris kicking up from the ground that he had to advance with a hand in front of his face to protect his eyes. Then he was holding up both hands with his partly gaze partly averted as he stumbled onward toward the upward and downward spires. Through the gaps in his fingers and the veil of the unsettled dust, Ulysses became aware of rectangular shadows rising from the ground around him, shadows that looked at once orderly and in disarray. Dropping his hands for a second, he realized he had entered a graveyard and he could hear the bell in the steeple begin to toll, as if rung by an invisible hand. He couldn't have been more than fifty yards from the church. But in all likelihood, it was fifty yards too far. For the twister was turning counterclockwise, and its winds were pushing Ulysses away from his goal rather than toward it. As hail began raining down upon him, he prepared for one final push. I can make it, he told himself. Then, running with all his might, he began closing the distance between himself and the sanctuary 
only to stumble over a low-lying gravestone and come crashing to the ground with the bitter resignation of the abandoned. Abandoned by who? asked Billy, with his book gripped in his lap and his eyes open wide. Ulysses smiled. I don't know, Billy. By fortune, by fate, by my own good sense, but mostly by God. The boy began shaking his head. You don't mean that, Ulysses. You don't mean that you were abandoned by God. But that's exactly what I mean, Billy. If I learned anything in the, in the war, it's that the point of utter abandonment, that moment at which you realize no one will be coming to your aid, not even your maker, is the very moment in which you may discover the strength required to carry on. The good Lord does not call you to your feet with hymns from the cherubim and Gabriel blowing his horn. He calls you to your feet by making you feel alone and forgotten. For only when you have seen that you are truly forsaken, you will embrace the fact that what happens next rests in your hands and your hands alone. Lying on the ground of that graveyard, feeling the old abandonment and knowing it for what it was, Ulysses reached up and took a hold of the top of the nearest gravestone. As he hoisted himself upward, he realized the stone he was pushing on was not weathered or worn. Even through the maelstrom of dust and debris, he could see it had the dark gray luminescence of a stone that had just been planted. Rising to his full height, Ulysses found himself looking over the shoulders of the marker down into a freshly dug grave, at the bottom of which was the shiny black top of a casket. This is where the caravan of cars had been coming from, realized Ulysses. They must have been right in the middle of the interment when they received warning of the tornado's approach. The reverend must have hurried through whatever verses would suffice to commit the soul of the deceased to heaven, and then everyone had dashed for their cars. From the look of the coffin, it must have been for a man of some wealth, for this was no pine box. It was a polished mahogany with handles of solid brass. On the lid of the coffin was a matching brass plaque with the dead man's name, Noah Benjamin Elias. Sliding down into the narrow gap between the coffin and the wall of the grave, Ulysses bent over to unscrew the cl clasps and open the coffin's lid. Inside was Mr. Elias, lying in state, dressed in a three-piece suit with his hands crossed neatly on his chest. His shoes were as black and shiny as his coffin, and curving across the vest, his vest was the thin gold chain of a watch. Though only about five foot six, Mr. Elias must have weighed over 200 pounds, having dined in a manner suited to his station. What was the nature of Mr. Elias's earthly success? Was he the owner of a bank or lumber yard? Was he a man of grit and determination or of greed and deceit? Whichever he was, he was no longer. And all that mattered to Ulysses was that this man, who was only five foot six, had had a big enough sense of himself to be buried in a coffin that was six feet long. Reaching down, Ulysses took hold of Elias by the lapels, just as you would when you intended to shake some sense into someone. Pulling him up out of the coffin, Ulysses hoisted him into a standing position so that they were almost face to face. Ulysses could now see that the mortician had applied rouge on the dead man's cheeks and scented him with gardenia, giving him the unsettled semblance of a harlot. Bending his knees in order to get under the weight of the cadaver, Ulysses raised him up out of his resting place and dumped him at the side of the grave. Taking one last look at the great black finger that was swaying left and right as it bore down upon him, Ulysses lay back in the pleated white silk that lined the empty coffin, reached up a hand and... Blackout. That's the end of Ulysses chapter. All right, page 333. Got another chapter from Pastor John. Don't like him. <laughs> if you read the other section with him in it, you'll understand. Anyway. When the vengeance of the Lord is visited upon us, it does not rain down from the heavens like a shower of meteors trailing fire. 
It does not strike like a bolt of lightning accompanied by clasps of thunder. It does not gather like a tidal wave far out at sea and come crashing down upon the shores. No. When the vengeance of the Lord is vis visited upon us, it begins as a breath in the desert. Gentle and undaunting, this little expiration turns three times above the hardened ground, quietly stirring the dust and the scent of the sagebrush. But as it turns three times more and three times again, this little whirlwind grows to the size of a man and begins to move. Spiraling across the land, it gains in velocity and volume, growing to the size of a colossus swaying and sweeping up into its vortex all that lays within its path. First the sand and stones, the shrubs and varmints, and then the works of men. Until at long last, towering a hundred feet tall and moving at a hundred miles an hour, swirling and spinning, turning and twisting, it comes inexorably for the sinner. Thus concluded the thoughts of Pastor John as he stepped from the darkness and swung his oaken staff in order to smite the negro called Ulysses on the crown of his head. Left for dead. That's what Pastor John had been. With the tendons of his right knee torn, the skin of his cheeks abraden, abraded, his right eye swollen shut, he lay among the, the bushes and brambles preparing to deliver his own absolution. But at the very moment of his demise, the Lord had found him by the side of the tracks and breathed new life into his limbs, lifting him up from the gravel and scrub. He had carried him to the edge of a cool running stream, where his thirst was slaked. His wounds washed and into his hands delivered the branch of an ancient oak to be used as a staff. In the hours that followed, not once did Pastor John wonder where he was going, how he would get there, or to what end, for he could feel the Spirit of the Lord working through him, making of him its instrument. From the river bank, it led him back through the woods, to a siding where ten empty box cars had been left unattended. Once he was safely inside, it brought forth a locomotive that hitched the cars and carried him eastward to the city of New York. When Pastor John disembarked in the great rail yard situated between Pennsylvania Station and the Hudson River, the spirit shielded him from the eyes of the railway guards and led him not into the crowded streets, but up onto the tracks of an elevated line. With his weight on his staff in order to spare his knee, Pastor John moved along the elevated, casting his shadow down upon the avenues. Once the sun had set, the spirit led him onward, through an empty warehouse, through a gap in a fence, through the high and scraggly grass, through the darkness itself, until in the distance he could see a campfire shining like a star. Drawing closer, Pastor John saw that in his infinite wisdom, the good Lord had lit the fire not only to guide him, but to illuminate the faces of the Negro and the boy, even as it made Pastor John's presence invisible to them. In the shadows outside the circle of the fire, Pastor John stopped and listened as the boy finished a story and asked if the Negro would tell one of his own. Oh, how John had laughed to hear Ulysses rattle on about his frightful tornado, for that little twister was nothing compared to the widening gyre, which is the vengeance of the Lord. Did he seriously think he could throw a pastor from a moving train without fear of retribution, that his actions would somehow escape the eyes of the divine and the hand of judgment? The Lord God is all-seeing and all-knowing, Pastor John said without speaking, he has paid witness to your misdeeds, Ulysses. He has paid witness to your arrogance and trespass. And he has brought me here to deliver his reprisal. With such fury did the Spirit of the Lord breathe into the limbs of Pastor John. When he brought his oaken staff down upon the Negro's head, the force of the blow snapped the sna staff in two. When Ulysses slumped to the ground and Pastor John stepped into the light, the boy, complicit with the negro at every step, stretched out his hands in the silent horror of the damned. 
May I join you by your fire? asked the pastor with a loud and hearty laugh. His staff truncated. Pastor John was forced to limp toward the boy, but this didn't worry him, for he knew the boy would go nowhere and say nothing. Rather, he would draw into himself like a snail in its shell. Sure enough, when the pastor when Pastor John pulled him up by the collar of his shirt, he could see that the boy had clenched his eyes closed and begun his incantation. There is no Emmet here, said the pastor. No one is coming to your aid, William Watson. Then, with the boy's collar fast in his grip, Pastor John raised the broken staff and prepared to deliver that lesson which Ulysses had interrupted two days before, to deliver it with interest. But just when the staff was poised to fall, the boy opened his eyes. I am truly forsaken, he said with a mysterious gusto. Then he kicked the pastor in his injured knee. With an animal howl, Pastor John let loose the boy's shirt and dropped his staff. Hopping in place with tears of pain falling from his one good eye, Pastor John became more committed in his intent to teach the boy a lesson he wouldn't soon forget. But even as he thrust his hands outward, he could see through his tears that the boy was gone. Eager to pursue, Pastor John looked frantically about for something to replace his broken staff. Ha-ha, he shouted, for there on the ground was a shovel. Picking it up, Pastor John stuck the blade into the dirt, leaned on the handle, and began moving slowly toward the darkness into which the boy had disappeared. After a few steps, he could just make out the silhouettes of an encampment, a small pile of firewood covered with a tarp, a makeshift wash stand, a line of three empty bedrolls, and a tent. William, he called softly. Where are you, William? What's going on out there? came a voice from inside the tent. Holding his breath, Pastor John took a step to the side and waited as a stocky negro emerged. Not seeing the pastor, he walked a few feet forward and stopped. Ulysses? he asked. When Pastor John hit him with a flat of the shovel, he fell to the ground with a mo groan. Off to his left, Pastor John could hear the other voices now, the voices of two men who may have heard the commotion. Forget the boy, he said to himself. Using the shovel as his crutch, he hobbled as quickly as he could back to the campfire and made his way to where the boy had been sitting. There on the ground were the book and flashlight, but where was that damnable rucksack? Pastor John looked back in the direction from which he had come. Could it have been by the bedrolls? No. Where the book and the flashlight were, the rucksack was sure to be. Leaning over carefully, Pastor John dropped the shovel, picked up the flashlight, and switched it on. With a hop, he trained the beam onto the backside of the railroad ties and began moving from right to left. There it is. Sitting down on a tie with his injured leg stretched before him, Pastor John retrieved the rucksack and set it on his lap. Even as he did so, he could hear the music within. With growing excitement, he undid the straps and began withdrawing items and tossing them aside. Two shirts, a pair of pants, a washcloth, and at the very bottom, he found the tin. Liberating it from the bag, he gave a celebratory shake. Tomorrow morning, he would pay a visit to the Jews on 47th Street, in the afternoon, he would go to a department store for a new set of clothes. And tomorrow night, he would check into a fine hotel where he would take a long, hot bath and send out for oysters, a bottle of wine, perhaps. Perhaps even some female companionship. But now, it was time to leave. Returning the flashlight and tin to the rucksack, he cinched its straps and hooked it over his shoulder, ready at last to be on his way. Pastor John leaned to his left in order to pick up the shovel, only to find that it was no longer where he had blackout. Conk. Comeuppance had it coming to him. Good. All right. One more chapter here. This is Ulysses again. Maybe he turned out okay. Page... 338, Ulysses. First, 
there was darkness without recognition, and slowly, an awareness of it. An awareness that it wasn't the darkness of space, cold, vast, and remote. It was a darkness that was close and warm, a darkness that was covering him, embracing him in the manner of a velvet shroud. Creeping from the corners of his memory came the realization that he was still in the fat man's coffin. He could feel along his shoulders the smooth, pleated silk of the lining, and behind that, the sturdiness of the mahogany frame. He wanted to raise the lid, but how much time had passed? Was the tornado gone? Holding his breath, he listened. He listened through the pleated silk and polished mahogany and heard nothing. Not the sound of the wind whistling or of hail falling on the coffin lid or of the church bell swinging on his, its hook unattended. In order to be certain, he decided to open the coffin a crack. Turning his palms upward, he pressed at the lid, but the lid wouldn't budge. Was it possible that he had become weakened with hunger and fatigue? Surely not that much time had passed, or had it. Suddenly, it occurred to him with a touch of horror that in the aftermath of the storm, while he was unconscious, someone might have happened upon the open grave and shoveled the mound of topsoil onto the coffin, finishing the job. He would have to try again. After rolling his shoulders and flexing his fingers in order to restore the circulation to his limbs, he drew a breath, put his palms against the inner surface of the lid, and pushed with all his might against... Uh, as the sweat that formed on his brow ran in droplets into his eyes. Slowly, the lid began to open, and cooler air rushed into the coffin. With a sense of relief, Ulysses gathered his strength and pushed the lid all the way back, expecting to be gazing up into the afternoon sky. But it wasn't the afternoon. It looked to be the middle of the night. Raising a hand gently in the air, he saw that his skin reflected a flickering light, Listening, he heard the long, hollow horn of a ship and the laughter of a gull, as if he were somewhere at sea. But then, coming from a short distance, he heard a voice, the voice of a boy declaring his forsakenness, the, bo the voice of Billy Watson. And suddenly, Ulysses knew where he was. An instant later, he heard a grown man howling in anger or in pain, and though Ulysses didn't yet understand what had happened to himself, he knew what he must do. Having rolled onto his side with a great sluggish effort, he raised himself onto his knees. Wiping the sweat from his eyes, he discovered by the light of the fire that it was blood, not sweat. Someone had hit him on the head. Rising to his feet, Ulysses looked around the fire for Billy and for the man who had howled, but no one was there. He wanted to call out for Billy, but understood that to do so would signal to an unknown enemy that he had regained consciousness. He needed to get away from the fire, outside of the circle of light. Under the veil of darkness, he would be able to gather his wits and strength, find Billy, and then begin the process of hunting his adversary down. Stepping over one of the railroad ties, he walked five paces into the darkness and took his bearings. There was the river, he thought, turning on his feet, there was the Empire State Building, and there was their encampment. As he looked in the direction of Stu's tent, he thought he saw movement. Quietly, almost too softly to hear, came the voice of a man calling Billy, calling him by his given name. The man's voice may have been almost too soft to hear, but it wasn't too soft to recognize. While remaining in the darkness, Ulysses began circumventing the fire, moving carefully, quietly, inevitably, toward the preacher. Ulysses stopped short when he heard Stu call his name. A moment later, he heard the clang of metal and the thud of a body falling to the ground. Feeling a flash of anger with himself for being too cautious, Ulysses prepared to charge into the encampment when he saw a silhouette emerge from the darkness, moving unevenly. It was the preacher using Stu's shovel as a crutch. Dropping the shovel on the ground, he picked up the boy's flashlight, switched it on, and began searching for something. Keeping an eye on the preacher, Ulysses crept to the edge of the fire, reached over a railroad tie, and retrieved the shovel. When the preacher gave an exclamation of discovery, Ulysses stepped back into the darkness and watched as he picked up Billy's knapsack and sat with it in his lap. 
In an excited voice, the preacher began talking to himself about hotels and oysters and female companionship while withdrawing Billy's belongings and tossing them on the ground until he found the tin of dollars. At the same time, Ulysses began moving forward until he was directly behind the preacher. And when the preacher, having slung the knapsack over his shoulder, leaned to his left, Ulysses brought the shovel down. With the preacher now lying in a heap at his feet, Ulysses felt himself heaving. Giving his own injury, the effort to subdue the preacher had taken all his immediate strength. Worried that he might even faint, Ulysses stabbed the shovel into the ground and leaned on its hilt as he looked down to make certain the preacher was unmoving. Is he dead? It was Billy, standing at his side, looking down at the preacher too. No, said Ulysses. Astoundingly, the boy seemed relieved. Are you all right? asked Billy. Yes, said Ulysses. Are you? Billy nodded. I did like you said, Ulysses. When Pastor John told me that I was alone, I imagined that I had been forsaken by everyone, including my maker. Then I kicked him and hid beneath the firewood tarp. Ulysses smiled. You did well, Billy. What the hell is going on? Billy and Ulysses looked up to find Stu standing behind them with a butcher knife in hand. You're bleeding too, Billy said with concern. Stu had been hit on the side of the head, so the blood had run down from his ear onto the shoulder of his undershirt. Ulysses was suddenly feeling better now, more clear-headed and sure of foot. Billy, he said, why don't you go over there and fetch us the basin of water and some towels? Sticking his knife through his belt, Stu came alongside Ulysses and looked at the ground. Who is it? A man of ill intent, said Ulysses. Stu shifted his gaze to Ulysses' head. You better let me take a look at that. I've had worse. We've all had worse. I'll be all right. I know, I know, said Stu with a shake of the head. You're a big, big man. Billy arrived with the basin and towels. The two men cleaned their faces, then gingerly dabbed at their wounds. When they were done, Ulysses sat Billy down beside him on one of the railroad ties. Billy, he began, we've had quite a bit of excitement tonight. Billy nodded in agreement. Yes, we have, Ulysses. Emmett will hardly believe it. Well, that's just what I wanted to talk to you about. What with your brother trying to find his car and having to get you to California before the 4th of July, he's got a lot on his mind. Maybe it's for the best if we keep what happened here tonight between us, at least for now. Billy was nodding. It's probably for the best, he said. Emmett has a lot on his mind. Ulysses patted Billy on the knee. One day, he said, you will tell him. You will tell him and your children, too, about how you bested the preacher, just like one of the heroes in your book. When Ulysses saw that Billy understood, he got up in order to speak with Stu. Can you take the boy back to your tent? Maybe give him something to eat? All right, but what are you going to do? I'm going to see to the preacher. Billy, who had been listening behind Ulysses' back, stepped around him with a look of concern. What does that mean, Ulysses? What does that mean you're going to see to the preacher? Ulysses and Stu looked from the boy to each other and back again. We can't leave him here, explained Ulysses. He's going to come too, just like I did. And whatever villainy had been on his mind before, I crowned him is going to be there still, only more so. Billy was looking up at Ulysses with a furrowed brow. So, continued Ulysses, I'm going to take him down the stairs and drop him at the police station? That's right, Billy. I'm going to drop him at the police station. Billy nodded to indicate that this was the right thing to do. Then Stu turned to Ulysses. You know, the uh, you know the stairs that go down to Gansevoort. I do. Someone's bent back the fencing there. It'll be an easier route, given what you'll be carrying. Thanking Stu, 
Ulysses waited for Billy to gather his things, for Stu to put out the fire, and for the two to go back to Stu's tent before he turned his attention to the preacher. Taking him under the armpits, Ulysses raised him up and draped him over his shoulders. The preacher wasn't heavier than Ulysses had expected, but he was gangly, making him an awkward burden. Shifting the body back and forth by increments, Ulysses tried to center it before he began walking in short, steady strides. When he reached the staircase, if Ulysses had stopped to think, he might have rolled the preacher down the steps to preserve his own strength. But he was moving now, and he had the preacher's weight evenly distributed across his shoulders, and he was worried that if he stopped, he might lose his balance or his momentum, and he would need them both. Because from the bottom of the stairs, it was a good 200 yards to the river. And that's the end of that chapter and will be the end of this section. Hope you enjoyed. We're, we're well into the second half now, officially. So hope that you enjoyed this one and I'll catch you next time. Bye.